Now I suppose that deep down all of us would love to be able to speak to our departed loved ones. Just hear a word from them, just give them a message about ourselves. We'd like to know exactly where they are and exactly what they are doing. We'd like to find out what happiness awaits them and us in the next life. And spiritualism claims to have the answer to this very deep need of the human heart. Now I'm going to approach it from a number of angles. And the first angle is just a historical one, asking when and where the spiritualistic practice arose. Now there's no doubt about it that this is probably one of the most ancient practices of the human race, going way back through the centuries into the dim recesses of time. It's certainly mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Ulysses was a man who practiced this. If you've read Homer's Odyssey, you'll know that the ancient Greeks sought to contact the dead. And all through the centuries, there have been people who have claimed to do this. But I'm concerned primarily with the modern movement the one that you'll meet today, the one that you'll uh, come in contact with. And funnily enough, this started in the middle of the 19th century in the United States and once again on the eastern coast and like a number of the other movements we've been looking at was largely led by women. Isn't it astonishing how many of these movements started in the eastern part of the United States in the middle of the last century. I'll tell you why I think that happened. Because about 1859, and leading up to that and following that, there was a tremendous spiritual revival in America, and on this side of the Atlantic as well, in Northern Ireland, and in other places in the British Isles. And it seems that wherever the Holy Spirit is active, other spirits become active too. And this would be one reason, I think, why there is this strange feature of so many movements starting at that time in that place and are now exported over to this side of the Atlantic and we grapple with them. Now, the founders of the modern spiritualist movement were two sisters by the name of Fox. And when they were both quite young, they were the youngest of six girls, when they were both quite young, these two sisters, Margaret and Kate, began to experience what is called poltergeist activity. Weird things began to happen in their bedroom. Furniture was moved and even thrown around the room. The bedclothes were pulled off them and so on. Being children, they were not terribly frightened, but more curious than frightened, and they began to try and contact whoever was doing this. And they developed a very simple system of communication with the invisible beings who were moving things around, of rapping. And they asked whoever was doing it to knock three times for yes, one for no, and two for doubtful. And the poltergeist activity began to take the form of knocking. Later they discovered that there was a story of a man who had been murdered in the house in which they lived and buried in the cellar. And this was taken to link up with what was happening. But after a time they were pronounced as mediums, people who could communicate with the spirit world. One of them, many years later, after marriage, returned to this house and began to develop this activity and formed what she called the Society of Spiritualists. And that's where the name began. She toured the cities of the United States talking of this society, enlisting support for it. In later years, Margaret did confess that the rapping which was heard at her meetings was in fact a hoax that she had learned how to crack her joints noisily and that this was how it was done. It was she who confessed this, it wasn't anyone else. Some years after that she took back the confession and said that the confession wasn't true and then took to drink. 
but this is uh, the beginning. So now having told you about the two sisters, let me now talk to you about the various societies that have ultimately sprung from their activity. Many mediums took up the practice of the occult, and I'm afraid many people saw it as a lucrative business and cashed in on the act. But it spread throughout America and then finally came to Europe. The first big association was in 1863, the Nationalist, the National Spiritualist Association. Then in 1907, the Progressive Spiritualist Church. And then in 1914, the National Christian Spiritualists. Then in 1936, you can see how recent a lot of this is, the International General Assembly of Spiritualists was held. And finally in 1944, there came into being a body known as the Federation of Spiritualist Churches and Associations. And that pretty well links most major groups together. So that 1944 is quite recent. Within this federation formed in 1944, there are now some two million people in the world who are registered as associate members. There must be, I suppose, another three million of adherents and possibly 10 or 15 million sympathizers, so that it's no small thing. In this kingdom, in 1960, there were a thousand churches with about a quarter of a million members, so that it's uh, about half the size of the Baptist denomination, for example, to give you a rough idea by comparison. It has also numbered some very outstanding people among its patrons. Harriet Martineau was a keen spiritualist, as was Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and if you've been a Sherlock Holmes fan, as I have, um, then uh, you'll probably know about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And from his writings, you'll have come across certain comments on the spiritualist movement. Sir William Crookes, Lord Dowding, the chief of the Royal Air Force, was a spiritualist. <coughs> Mackenzie King was another. And there have been some quite outstanding people, intelligent people, uh, brainy people, who have uh, patronized the whole movement. It does not follow, by the way, that because a man is an expert in one field, that never that because of this he can pronounce on another field. But I mention this, that these great men were in the movement. Now that's the history of it in a nutshell, not very exhaustive, but it gives you the feel of the thing. I want now to examine it from what we call the theological angle, in other words, how its beliefs line up with what Christians believe. Most spiritualists began in a Christian church. Once again, they seem to have made most of their converts not from the world, but from the church. And usually again, quite characteristically, <coughs> from members of churches where they were not taught the Bible and did not have a firm grasp of their own faith. And something like a third of the spiritualists in Great Britain, so I'm informed by someone in a position to know, something like a third are ex-Roman Catholics. This is perhaps very significant. It's a very high number, and I think there's a, uh, some meaning in this. Now, they use a lot of Christian language. Their church names reveal this. For example, the Church of Christian Fellowship is one, the Temple of the Holy Trinity is another, the Church of the Spirit is a third, though there are some variations between them. First of all, what do they believe about God? I find it a little difficult to find this out. God seems to be somewhat impersonal, a kind of force rather than a person. And I found this again and again. Incidentally, I lived with two spiritualists for a year, and I found this in personal conversation also. It's not easy to get a strong sense of a person, and particularly of three persons in one. The Holy Spirit seems to be uh, more an electrical or impersonal force rather than 
a person you can grieve and who can teach you. But there isn't a great deal of unorthodoxy at that point. What do they believe about men? That man has an earthly body, that he is animated by a soul, which is called the astral body or heavenly body, that at death that one is finished with forever, and the astral body, which is regarded as the real one, uh, goes on in its separate existence forever. In other words, there is no belief in resurrection, but rather the immortality of the soul or astral body. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now what about Jesus Christ? What is believed about him? He is presented as a medium rather than a mediator. And there's a very important distinction between those two words. Uh, the Bible doesn't describe him as a medium. It does describe him as a mediator, which is a, a rather different thing. One statement I came across in one spiritualist book was this. Any just and perfect being is Christ. Now, we have met this before. We met it last week in Christian Science. We've met it in something else. It's an idea that Christ doesn't refer to a particular person called Jesus, but is more a divine state which he had, which others might have. And this kind of depersonalized view of Christ does seem to come out. As far as I can find out, the virgin birth is denied. And the death of Christ is certainly not regarded as an atoning death. I quote from one book, the atonement, this is as Christians understand it, is the very climax of a deranged imagination and one of the most unrighteous and immoral tendency. The orthodox doctrine of the atonement was a survival of the greatest abusers of earlier times and it was immoral to the core. Now, spiritualists are not the only one who feel this way. Some Orthodox Christians, or rather some church members, also find it difficult to accept that Jesus was punished for our sins, though this is clearly the Orthodox doctrine of the cross. As far as the resurrection of Jesus goes, he rose in spirit but not in body. And the records that talk of him eating fish and having flesh and bones are mistaken records and are in error at this point. The return of Christ I haven't been able to find mentioned at all. What then about sin and salvation? There seems to me a much greater stress on happiness than salvation or holiness, a much greater emphasis on comfort than salvation. And sin does seem to be played down, especially in its aspect of the fall of Adam and the sin he passed on to every member of the human race. This is very definitely played down. As far as the future goes, another area of Christian belief, which we're looking at on Sunday mornings, the spiritualists do not believe in the resurrection of the body, a body of flesh, they do not believe in the day of judgment and they do not believe in the existence of hell. And these are my three subjects for the next three Sunday mornings. There's something very crucial here. I give you quotes from their writings so that I'm not uh, maligning. We affirm that the existence and personal identity of the individual continue after the change called death. We affirm that the doorway to reformation is never closed against any human soul here or hereafter. And I get the impression that life after death is a series of purgatories, a series of reforming places that gradually bring a person nearer to the ideal bliss. In the area nearest to earth, it seems that the language of the mediums suggests that the activities are very earthly eating, drinking and sleeping and other words like this are used <coughs> but that this seems to drop out of the picture the higher you go. What about the Bible? 
This, of course, is the crucial thing, because if you accept a particular view of the Bible, it affects all these views. I quote from them, We have no desire to hide the plain fact that there is much in some parts of the Bible which does not amalgamate with our teaching. Now that's a frank statement from the publication Spiritualist Teachings. It is therefore not the word of God. It cannot be if there is much in it that conflicts with the truth. Now that's the theological approach. Now the moral approach that's looking not so much at belief but at behavior. That's discussing belief. Now we look at behavior. In the early days, there was a certain amount of loose moral practice among the spiritualists. But I'm the first to admit that this has now uh, largely gone. Free love and promiscuity were advocated in the early days, and this drew the movement into a certain amount of uh, discredit. In 1886, the first spiritualist convention said, there is no such thing as moral obligation. Vice is as good as virtue. That's quite a statement. But I don't think spiritualists today would say this. And I heard recently that a spiritualist church in S South America is one of the most outstanding in the area for its, um, its attack on social evil and its service to those in need. I think you could sum up their morals by the word love. Now that word is, is an elastic word, it can mean a lot, it can mean a little, it can mean a very high thing, a very low thing, but there is a tremendous stress on the word love. I get the impression that it is a love that is centered in the heart rather than the will, an emotional rather than a, a volitional thing, but then they're not the only ones to perhaps get that misunderstanding. You see, if love is a thing that you feel for people, you can't commend it. It would only happen. Whereas Jesus said, thou shalt love. And the kind of love that most people sing about and talk about, you can't tell a person to have. And the love of which Jesus spoke is not an emotional thing. It may have feelings attached to it, but it's something that Jesus can tell a person to do. And the nearest English equivalent that I know is care. And it's something you can do even to someone you don't like. And the Good Samaritan did it to someone he didn't like. There are now moral requirements for both ministers and mediums. But on the whole, it does seem there, there is this stress on happiness rather than holiness. Now I approach this from the psychical point of view and begin to ask about the various methods that are used. <coughs> now I'll just mention one or two so that you're aware of them and so that if ever you find yourself in a party for example where they're playing about like this you'll be aware of them. A lot of sixth formers in grammar schools start dabbling with things like this for a kick and don't realize how serious it can be or where it can lead. And people do it at parties and so on. Things like uh, table tilting and rapping, playing of musical instruments, slate writing, automatic writing, materializing, that means the becoming visible of, of uh, the departed, levitation, bodies being raised from the floor, um, lengthening of a medium's body, Ouija boards, photos, um, there are many methods like this, but the most common is the trance in which a medium seeks to be possessed by a spirit. Now that brings me to the mediums, and there are in fact 28 different kinds of medium who operate in different ways and who bring their messages in different ways. The main ones that you uh, will come across First of all, what's called the impersonating medium. She, it's usually a she, she usually seeks to uh, contact, literally a contact on the other side, 
a spirit, very often a red Indian or an Indian spirit, and this is again very significant, I think, um, who will then can put the medium in touch with the dead person. So in fact, there is a kind of fourfold stage. Here you are, you go to the medium who gets through to the contact, who contacts the dead. So that the message comes through, in fact, three stages to you. From the dead person to the contact on the other side, from the contact to the medium, from the medium to yourself. And there is this kind of progress, progressive thing. That's the impersonating medium that you must have heard about. Then there is called, there's what's called the motive medium, who has magnetic powers over various objects. There is the clairvoyant medium, who can see things at a distance, and who can describe events, uh, or objects, or people, without being able to see them. There is the impressional medium, who tends to live an almost completely double life, uh, one of which is in the spirit world and one in this world. But I think we'll pretty well limit what we have to say to this, but there are 27 other types of medium than this. Now I approach it just from a mental angle. What do we think about all that happens? I remember going to see a lady who'd lost her husband. She didn't come to church, but a neighbor said, would you go and see her? I think she needs a talk. And I went to see her. And she said, I want to ask you uh, about something that has happened to me yesterday. She said, my sister took me to a seance. And she said, they got through, so they said, to my dead husband. And messages came back describing things that nobody but he could know. There was some message about handkerchiefs in a particular drawer that she was absolutely sure that nobody on earth knew and that she had not even been thinking about when the message came. Now she said, what do you think about it? And I said, I take it very seriously indeed. And she said, well, that's such a relief to me because she said, I thought every minister would laugh at it. I said, I don't laugh at it. It's too serious. She said, you believe there's something in it? And I said, I certainly do believe there's something in it. Then she said, it's all right to go. I said, it's just the opposite. And it's precisely because I do believe there's something in it that I urge you not to go. Now, the upshot of the, the whole interview and later talks was that she came to know Christ and she found then all the comfort that she needed, all the assurance that she needed about the future. But it was as near as that. Now then, what do we think about such messages which are so clearly supernatural? Well, now, there are six possibilities. One is that in some way it is a fraud. And there's no doubt about it that some, some activity called spiritualist has been just sheer chicanery. No doubt about it. I think the, the best example I know of that, and it's a humorous one, you've heard of Harry Houdini, the chap who got out of all kinds of weird situations. Because he was so good at spotting tricks, because he was so expert himself, they did get him to go and attend a seance in New York, where the method used was the playing of musical instruments. Instruments were put on the table and people sat in a circle well back from it and then the spirits were invited to, in this case, to blow a trumpet giving the messages. You've probably heard of this. And Houdini was invited to go along and look at it. And he did. And the lights went out, they heard the trumpet and so on. And the lights went on again. But when they went on again, one of the ladies sitting around in the circle had a black mouth and he had covered the mouthpiece with boot polish, um, which of course was not seen in, in the dark. That is not to say that all of it or even most of it is fraud. It's just to say that this is a possibility. And I'm afraid because it can be a lucrative business to some, there are the frauds in it. But then there are frauds in most businesses. So that doesn't make the final comment. There is the possibility of self-deception. That's a possibility in every walk of life, that you can 
deceive yourself into thinking something has happened when it hasn't. We've all experienced, I think, when we've thought we've seen someone walking down the high street and we've said to them later in the day, saw you in the high street, and they've said, well, we weren't there, we've been up in London for the day. But I could have sworn I saw you in the high street. And we have, in fact, really talked ourselves into believing that we did. Something set it off, but in fact what we were sure of was not true. That's a possibility, but I don't think it's the answer. Telepathy is a third possibility. Nowadays, people don't talk about telepathy. They talk about ESP, extrasensory perception. But it's the same thing, knowing things without having any direct contact or knowledge. Now, I have no doubt at all that there are occasions when people are telepathic. Uh, this has happened in my own life. I'm sure it's happened in yours. When a loved one far away knew that something wrong had happened to you. This is a simple uh, example of telepathy. I'm sure how many of you have had that kind of experience? Uh, quite a few already, and probably more if you thought about it. The communication of thoughts to one another, knowing something about someone else without being told, especially between people closely related. Now, people are saying, is it a case of telepathy? Is the person actually, uh, by telepathy, communicating thoughts about the loved one to the medium, which are then being fed back as a message from the other side? It could be, but I don't think necessarily is. A development of that is the gift of clairvoyance. Now, telepathy is passing of thought from one mind to another. But clairvoyance uh, is simply one mind knowing things not related necessarily to another person. And I have no doubt myself that some people have a gift of clairvoyance, second sight, sixth sight, sixth sense, whatever you like to call it. There's a, another idea which I, I think is, um, I don't know, I'll try and tell you what it means. The collective unconscious. Now this is the this is the psychologist's explanation of it. And if I can do it in a diagram, this might help. Here is my mind, here is your mind, our conscious mind. The belief is that deep down, below the conscious level, all our minds are in fact joined up like this. This is the theory. And that from this collective unconscious, our instincts come and the ideas that we all have come from this. Now this is the theory. I don't think there's any evidence to support it. But in this case, they say if deep down our minds are all connected subconsciously, unconsciously, what this person knows can be fed through to that person. And it's simply a case of feeding along. Well, it's an interesting theory, but I think it's no more. We are left with two possibilities. One is that in fact the messages are coming from the dead and that it is uh, genuine. The other is the line that the Bible seems to take and it's this, that you are contacting another world but you are not contacting the dead, you are contacting spirits. Now, the Bible everywhere accepts that there are other beings in the universe apart from men. They are called in some places angels. That is if they are good. Where they become evil, they are called demons. But both words are very misleading. One of these days I want to speak to you about angels and demons and tell you what they really mean. But most people think of sort of long fair hair with wings, you know, the, you know, the kind of thing in a nightdress and, and this. Um, as I've said before, if that's what they look like, you would never entertain one unawares. <laughs> you know, the kind of demon picture. Now, neither of those is anywhere near the truth. And because we've caricatured both, we tend to get a wrong idea. Demons are evil spirits whom we must take desperately seriously. Their object is to destroy. 
to take people away from God and from Christ if they possibly can. Now the Bible does allow that evil spirits can contact men, especially if men are trying to contact spirits. And once this contact is made, you will realize this. Spirits, being above men in the creation scale, are far more intelligent and have far more knowledge. They therefore have supernatural knowledge about your loved ones. And they can feed back information which no human being knows, but which they know, which is utterly convincing to a person. And naturally so, because here is knowledge that nobody could possibly know about. And the problem for all spiritualists is this. How do you test? How do you find out what you're contacting when you get through and these messages come? It's absolutely vital that a person who is contacting spirit should test. A person who is receiving any communication from the supernatural should test that straight away to see what source it comes from. And the Bible, sure enough, gives us a number of basic and simple tests that we can apply. And I'll go into these now. So we now come finally to the biblical attitude. Now, according to the spiritualists, there are at least four passages which support spiritualism and are for it. I'm going to add in a moment those against, but I want to deal with the four that they use in the Bible to support their practice. The first is in 1 Samuel chapter 28, where Saul went to a woman, not a witch, that's a bad translation, a medium. And the spiritualists say, here is a case in the Bible of a man trying to contact the dead through a medium. If it's in the Bible, it is all right. And he was trying to contact <coughs> Samuel, the prophet, who died a few years previously. Now then, when we look at the story, we find some very astonishing things from this point of view. First, we notice that under God's command, Saul had banished every medium from the land. God had said there must be no mediums in this holy land. And Saul had banished them all, but one had managed to stay put, and people were visiting her secretly. There came a day when Saul, instead of turning to God for guidance, because he was in a wrong relationship to God, wanted some supernatural guidance and thought of trying to get to a medium. He made inquiries. And he was told that there was still one at a village called Endor. I visited the village. You probably saw it, did you, Mr. Brooking, a few days ago? Well, now, in this village lived this woman. And Saul went to her disguised as a peasant. Showed there was something wrong in his going anyway, that he had to go in disguise. And when he went in, he said, are you a medium? Can you contact the spirit? And she said, uh, now, if I say yes, you're going to tell the king. So the answer is no. And he persuaded her. And then he got through. Now the most interesting thing in the story to me is that the woman, the medium, was absolutely astonished when Samuel appeared. This is to me the funniest thing in the whole story. She was absolutely shaken when she got through, which makes me wonder about the rest of the things she'd been doing. But the whole point of the story is this, that God said to Saul, because you did this, you are going to die. Now that may sound a pretty severe judgment, but remember that he was the king, the leader of a nation, and that if the king is dabbling about in this, what's going to happen to the nation? And remember too that he had actually banished mediums from the land and knew perfectly well that it was wrong. And here he is trying to get through. So that frankly that passage, when you re read it thoroughly, says no, not yes. A second passage is the story of Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. But the obvious comment that one would like to make is first that there was no medium present. And second, 
that there was no conversation between the disciples and Moses and Elijah. So once again, there is no real parallel. The third passage, which is said to be for spiritualism, are the resurrection stories of Jesus and he, as a dead spirit, contacted the living. But it was not a spirit who came, it was a body. And it's no use picking and choosing among the stories and saying everywhere it mentions his body, that's wrong. You can't play about with the Bible like this. And he said, is that fish and chips on the table you've got for supper? Give me some. I, I'm going to eat it. And he did. And they watched him eat it. And they knew it was a body. The fourth passage is 1 Corinthians 12, where the gifts of the Spirit are listed. And certain supernatural gifts of communication are there mentioned. Gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, gift of prophecy, gift of healing, and so on. Now there is no doubt that these are supernatural gifts and gifts of supernatural communication. But they are gifts of communicating between God and men. They are never related to the dead. The gift of prophecy is to speak the word of God to men. The gift of knowledge is to know what God knows about something or someone. The gift of <clears throat> miracles and so on, none of these are connected with communication with the dead. And that passage, <coughs> sorry, doesn't support either. So that means that when you examine all four passages for this in the Bible, there isn't one that really stands up. But when we look at against, my, you find them piling up. If you're taking notes and you want the references, can you write quickly and look them up when you get home? Exodus 20, verse 18. Leviticus 19, 31. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. 2 Kings 21, verse 6. Am I going too quickly? Deuteron sorry, Isaiah 8, verse 19, 2, verse 6, 19, verse 3, 29, verse 4, Micah, chapter 5, verse 12, and so I could go on. Now, spiritualists have said to me that these are only part of the Old Testament, like eating pork and this kind of thing. But let me now give you the New Testament ones. Galatians 5.20, 1 Timothy 4.1, 2 Thessalonians 2.9, quite a lot in Acts, Acts 8 verses 9 to 11, 13, 6 to 8, 16, 16, 19, 19, Revelation 9.21 and Revelation 21.8. I would think that's enough to go on with. Even if spiritualists accepted and taught orthodox Christian doctrine, which they don't, we would still be forbidden to communicate with the dead. Now I come finally to the psychological angle on this because it's very important. First of all, is that spelt right? I can't spell when I'm close to it. It's near enough. You can put it right in your notes. Why do people go to spiritualists? Psychologically, why do they go? What is the cause? And what is the effect of going psychologically? Well, why do they go? Of those I have talked to, I've discovered three reasons. The first was just plain curiosity. A desire to know about something they didn't know about. This is what happens to a lot of school children. It's something unknown, something to dabble in. They're curious. The fascination of the mysterious. There is another group who go either through fear or doubt about the future. Death is the greatest fact of life. Job's question, if a man die, shall he live again? We want an answer. And the third reason I found that people go is sheer loneliness. <clears throat> After bereavement, they are alone. 
And I think that's probably the greatest psychological cause, sheer loneliness. And therefore, if we are going to say that is not the way to solve loneliness of this kind, we must be quite sure that we are prepared to supply the adequate alternative. Now, what is the effect of going... By the way, two world wars increased this third terrifically. The two great waves of growth in the spiritualist movement were after two world wars, when thousands of families could have sung the hymn, Oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Two world wars boosted this movement tremendously. What is the effect, psychologically, of finding comfort this way? These are serious charges, I realize, but they're based upon observation. One is selfishness, a preoccupation with comforting self and getting more and more comfort for self. A second is psychological disturbance. A lady called Mrs. Travers Smith, who was 20 years a medium, said this afterwards, It is wise and sane not to make the attempt to speak with the dead. The chances against genuine communication are about 10 to 1. The disappointments and the doubts connected with the experiments are great. And it is the disappointment and the doubt that causes the psychological disturbance. That while there is immediate comfort from the contact, disappointment and doubt come in again later. <clears throat> there are questions you try and get answered which don't get answered. And this begins to lead to an uncertain state. Thirdly, in some cases, spiritism has led to insanity. Now, I don't know if you were here the, the morning the Prime Minister read the lesson over the radio. Were you here that morning? Do you remember the testimony of the man from Liverpool who was in a mental home because he'd been dabbling in spiritism since he was 12? And he then found Christ and was now a normal, sane man again, working for, for his living. I give you only one figure. Out of 24,000 cases of insanity recently investigated, 7,500 were directly attributable to spiritualism. Now that's a pretty alarming figure. People had dabbled and it had led from disturbance through to this. And the fourth possible thing and the most dangerous and difficult of all is of course demon possession. That does not happen to everybody who dabbles, but it is a possibility once you open yourself to contact with the spirit world. And that is something that we are told to watch very carefully. I said this was my last heading. It isn't. My last is the practical way. On a practical issue, what do we do about it? First, it is wise for the Christian never to play with spiritualism. It is dangerous. It's a very delicate situation. It is easier to take up than to drop. And my first advice would be leave it right alone. Even if you are tempted needing comfort, even if you're finding it difficult <coughs> without some assurance of this direct kind, leave it alone if you possibly can. If for any reason you find yourself in a situation like this, then test the spirits. Now, I was talking to a man down in Cardiff, and he was telling me of an interesting experience. He's a Christian, and he's in business with a retired army major who is not a Christian. And the retired army major said to this man one night, and said, uh, what do you think of spiritualism? And uh, my friend told him that you can get through to spirits, that you can contact evil spirits, and that this could be damaging. And the Major said, well, how do you know when you're through to this? How can you, you tell? And my friend said, well, there's a scriptural test. It's very simple. If a spirit will not say that Jesus has come in the flesh, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not of God. 
Now the major didn't let on, but he was going to a spiritualist seance that very night because his wife had been attending for some time and had persuaded her husband to go. Well, the major didn't let on, but he went to it and the following morning he came to the office in Cardiff and he said to my friend, he said, it works. And so my friend was a bit puzzled and said, what works? Well, he said, I went to a spiritualist seance last night. And he said, we got through and they were asking any of us if we wanted to ask any questions about anyone and messages were coming back. So he said, they asked me. And he said, I asked them to ask the medium whether Jesus had come in the flesh. And he said, when they asked the medium this question, a flood of language came from her mouth dirtier than anything I had ever heard in the army, more blasphemous than anything I'd heard in my life. And he said, people got up and left the room. He said, one man rushed past me saying, that's the end of that for me. And he said, I've come home. And he said, my wife won't go there again. So he said, it works. Now, he wasn't a Christian, but he was testing. I'll give you one more story. A lady not far from here became a Christian, but shortly afterwards, became a medium and went to the spiritualist center and began to act for other people. Now her minister met her shortly afterwards and said, Mrs. Son, so is this right, what I hear? And she said, yes. And he said, well, do you realize what you're doing? And she said, but it's Christian, it's Christian, I know it is. And he said, how do you know? Well, she said, I've said to the spirits, Jesus is my master. And they have replied, and is ours too. So it must be all right. And wisely he said, well, next time you are through to them, say this, Jesus is Lord. And tell them to say it, because nobody can say that. No spirit can say those words, an evil spirit. They will not say it. Even man doesn't say it except the Holy Ghost moves him. So she went and she got through. This is only a year or two ago. And she got through and she said, Jesus is Lord. Will you say that? And from that moment, she was never able to get through again. Her powers left her. And she's now back in the church where she was converted and going on well with the Lord. These are the tests were given in Scripture. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has come in the flesh. Risen in the flesh. These are the things the spirits do not accept. And these are the tests we've been given to apply. Now to come right back to us. Of course we long for household voices gone. Of course we long for comfort. Of course we want assurance. That's why I asked you earlier to list those things that have comforted you. My sister died two years ago. I would love to have some direct contact with her again. But I've got the assurance I need. I've got the comfort I need. And that comfort is in the simple fact that Christ links us together. That with one hand he holds us, with the other hand he holds them. I believe in the communion of saints. I don't believe in the communication of saints, but I believe in the communion of saints that draws us together. And therefore I draw my comfort direct from Jesus Christ. And this is the place to draw it. And if you do then you are left without the kind of psychological disturbance to which you can open yourself in other ways. This is the comfort we need, and it's all we do need. I'm going to suggest that we have a prayer now and then a closing hymn tonight. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are our Lord. We acknowledge this freely. We thank you that you came in the flesh, that you rose in your body, and we thank you that those who have died in your faith and fear will rise again, that we shall meet them in the air when you come. We look forward to this meeting. And until then, we are quite sure that those who have died trusting you are safe in your hands. We don't need to know where they are or what they are doing. They are with you in paradise. What more can we ask? We pray for faith that does not ask for sight. And though we would love to have the comfort of our senses in this, you have told us to walk by faith until that day when we no longer see through a glass darkly, but face to face, when we know even as we have been known, when the kingdom of heaven is thrown open to all believers. 
So Lord, help us to walk circumspectly, to be wise in our dealings with those who hold different views, different beliefs. We ask, O Lord, that you will help us to bring to the truth those who seek comfort, those who cannot find the answer and are therefore a prey to all manner of things. We pray that if there be any in this company this evening who are seeking for some assurance about the future, we ask that they may find it in Jesus Christ and in him alone. So bless us, we ask it for his name's sake. Amen.